Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Blue, Chair of the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee. Joining me to co-host this special ELECTS presentation is Cindy Hepfer, a member of the CE Committee. Welcome to today's webinar, Aiming for a Robust Metadata Infrastructure for the Future. Our speakers this afternoon from the Library of Congress are Dr. Deanna Markham, Associate Librarian for Library Services, and Beecher Wiggins, Director of Acquisitions and Bibliographic Access. They will discuss the factors that the three national libraries, the Library of Congress, the National Agriculture Library, and the National Library of Medicine, considered in reaching their conclusion that adopting RDA is an important part of creating a viable and robust metadata infrastructure for the future. Deanna will talk about her reactions to the recommendations of the U.S. RDA Test Coordinating Committee, while Beecher, who served as a co-chair of the Coordinating Committee, will comment on the testing procedures and explain how the time frame for implementing RDA was achieved. We allotted 90 minutes for today's webinar, so there will be plenty of time at the conclusion of the presentations for questions. We have a very large audience this afternoon, so please use the question box on the screen to submit your questions. The webinar is being recorded. Information about the recording will be available on the ELECTS website in a few days. Now I'm going to turn the podium over to Deanna. After Deanna's presentation, we will turn the presentation over to Beecher. There may be a slight delay as we do that. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Deanna Markham. I'm the Associate Librarian for Library Services at the Library of Congress. And I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. I thought it might be useful for me to provide some contextual background. Um, how, did, how did this evolve? Why did the Library of Congress get into um, this test? And what we've learned. So I'll just go through um, a brief background before Beecher talks about the specifics of the RDA test. You may recall that in 2006, when the Library of Congress announced that it was changing its policy on uh, series authorities. There was a great hue and cry in the library community about our decision. That was a wake-up call for me. I realized that we had not done a good enough job in communicating what we were trying to do and how we were thinking about the future. And after that episode, we formed an external working group on the future of bibliographic control. We had, um, I think we had 18, ultimately. I may have the number not quite right. Uh, but we had a, a fairly large number of representatives on the external working group representing the American Library Association, the Special Libraries Association, the American Association for Law Libraries, all of the associations of the Association of Research Libraries. We also had uh, representatives from Google and from Microsoft, from OCLC, and uh, the Coalition of Networked Information. This external working group spent uh, almost a year and a half studying the issues involved in uh, thinking about the future of bibliographic control. And they held three meetings across the country, had a website to invite people to um, submit their questions, submit their comments, submit papers they wanted us to read. And we taped all of the um, sessions that we had across the country and put them on our website. So everyone had a chance to think about these issues with us. On May 1, 2008, the external working group on the future of bibliographic control submitted its final report to me. And there were um, over 100 recommendations in that report. 
most of them had to do with greater collaboration, um, more transpar transparency, greater use of bibliographic resources that are developed by publishers and authors and other groups. But the most vexing um, of the recommendations was the recommendation that we put on hold um, RDA, the decision about RDA. And the um, external working group explained that it really didn't know enough about how it was going to work, how it would be tested, and how we could make a reasonable decision. And they asked for more information about that. The work on RDA had been going on for many years, I, I think eight or so at that time. And it was, it was a very hard decision. You know, what should we do? Um, much work had gone on with our international counterparts. They were getting close to having RDA ready to distribute. And yet this very prestigious group had recommended that we put it on hold. So I immediately convened my counterparts from the National Library of Medicine and the National Agricultural Library. And I asked them to join the Library of Congress in helping us think through what should be done. And I'm very pleased that um, our colleagues from the other two national libraries enthusiastically joined this effort. And you will hear from Beecher um, shortly about the test that we ultimately decided to uh, design and execute so that we could learn more, not only we three national libraries, but the entire library community, because we invited partners of different sizes and types of organizations to join us in that test. Now I should say just a word about the future, I, because Beecher is going to go into uh, more details about the test itself. One of the things we learned in doing the test is that it's not just the cataloging code that we need to consider. Many of the participants in the test noted that RDA would be much easier to use if we were not constrained by the mark carrier. And there were so many of those conversations that that has led us to talk with a wide range of colleagues across the country and around the world to talk about what is the next step in our bibliographic future. And uh, perhaps I can say a few words at the very end of this conversation about how we're putting together a, a group of experts who will help us consider what should be the carrier for bibliographic information that will allow us to link library resources to the resources on the, of the semantic web. And in all of this, you will see that our interest is in linking library users to the resources they need and making certain that libraries continue to play that vital role in making those connections between users and resources. So we, um, we are grateful to all of the all of the institutions that participated in the test, they provided invaluable information to us. We are deeply grateful to all of the colleagues who have given us their thoughts, their critiques, their suggestions, because we all realize that the bibliographic future um, is going to have to be created by those of us who are responsible for it right now. So uh, we all feel the the responsibility of that role, and we all feel privileged to be able to work on it. So I think with that, I'll stop. That is the 
background, how we got to where we are today. I'll turn it over to Beecher, and then I'll come back with a few words of, about my reaction to the test of, after Beecher explains what it was all about. Good afternoon. This is Beecher Wiggins. I, too, am happy to share in this webinar. I will give you information related to the RDA test, how we crafted it, and the outcome, what some of the findings were. Deanna has let you know why we determined that a test was useful. So I won't go into that. The next thing we had to consider once we realized that a test would be a valid way of determining how we should proceed with RDA was to frame that test and determine what we wanted to get out of the test. It seemed to us that the best approach would be to start with the goals that the Joint Steering Committee for development of RDA had determined that RDA would do for the community were it to be adopted. So that is the point that we started in framing the test itself. Out of that, there were three areas that we identified needed to be looked at in terms of what the outcome should show. There was general feasibility, that is, you have a general nature, what should a new code offer the bibliographic community? What were the, the second area was what technical aspects needed to be taken into account to be able to apply or apply this new code? And then finally, no small component what would be the financial impact? What would be the cost of moving forward? And you will see as we look at the goals that were set for RDA that these three areas do come into play. One of the goals was that RDA would be a consistent flexible, and it would be extendable, meaning that it could be applied to all sorts of resources and types of content. And as I go through each of these, I will give an indication of how the test indicated that goal was or was not met. This initial one was met, and that is no small feat. The second one focused on it being based on internationally accepted principles. This one was certainly partially met. Some of the feedback indicated that there was still some discord between or among the Joint Steering Committee, the ISBD community, and the ISSN community. Clearly, if the library community was adopting a code it should serve the needs of the library community. But RDA touted, or the Joint Steering Committee, 
indicated that in addition to the library community, <coughs> it, JSP was working on a code that would reach beyond the library community. Now we didn't, the coordinating committee did not focus on this. That was beyond our purview. So we simply did not weigh in on this aspect. The user requirements of the functional requirements of bibliographic records forever had four components that serve the, use, the user's need. Can the user find? Can the user identify? Can the user select? And can the user obtain resources that he or she is seeking? And we determined that this goal was partially met. And keep in mind, whenever we say we determined, we're basing this on the feedback and the data that we analyze from the participants in the test. Clearly, because of our legacy data and the size of existing databases and catalogs, whatever we adopted had to be interoperable with the existing catalogs and databases. And we would have to determine that this goal was mostly met. The new code needed to be independent of format medium so that data could be stored anywhere, retrieved, and served up. This goal was met. Equally important was looking to the future. We did not want to go through this again. And as new formats, new ways of presenting content were presented, we wanted to be able to say that this code would help us adopt to that. We can't say with certainty that the test verified this goal by its very nature and the limited amount of time we spent on it. This set of instructions were to be encompassed in an online tool, and that tool should be easy to use. We determined, based on the feedback, that that was not the case initially. And here's one of the goals that has caused a lot of deliberation and that we will spend some time on is that the code was written in plain English and that could be used by various language communities. We determined based on the test that this was not met. And finally, the new code should be easy to use as a training tool uh, as well as a working set of instructions for staff. And we determined that based on the test results that this was not met. Keep in mind as we go through the remaining portion of my presentation that much of what we say will loop back to these particular goals and their outcomes. And also it will help inform why we decided the decision that we recommended to our senior managers at the three national libraries. We identified 23 other institutions that we wanted to participate with us in the test. We wanted to be beyond the three national libraries. We also wanted this group to be diverse. We wanted all sizes. We wanted individual institutions. We wanted consortia. We definitely wanted the education community. We wanted different formats described, and we certainly wanted the largest cooperative cataloging arrangement in the world to be a part of this program for cooperative cataloging. And we achieved those goals with the 23 institutions that we identified to join us. The methodology that we used was to decide how do we want to approach this, what kind of materials do we want to cover. And we also wanted at least a test bed that we could consider controlled. So we came up with what we ended up describing as a common original set. And we'll talk a bit more about this. We also came up with a common copy set 
because copy cataloging is a big aspect of the work that we do. Then we had what we call the original, the extra original set and the extra copy set. And I'll give a bit more information about these as I move forward. For the common original set, we needed to identify a set group of materials that each of the test institutions would catalog because we wanted to end up with something that we could say served as a benchmark and that we could do comparisons of the outcomes. And these had to be cataloged once using RDA and then once using whatever the current cataloging code was. And in most instances, that turned out to be AECR2. And again, we want a range, wanted a range of materials, textual, so we ended up with 10 monographs, 5 AV materials, audiovisual materials, 5 serials, both print and non-print, and 5 integrating resources. For the common copy set, we identified five resources, and we made up these five because we wanted to cover specific areas and because of the nature of copy cataloging, we couldn't wait until we encountered something. So we came up with the five that you see, monograph, a serial, a translation, a compilation, and a novel. The biggest amount of data that would be created using RDA would be what we characterize as the extra set. And by this, we simply meant whatever materials the test institutions normally processed, at the end of completing the 25 titles that were common, they should use RDA to process all materials during the three-month period. The three-month period that we are describing was from October 1, 2010 through 11, sorry, 10, 2010 through December 2010. And we wanted to make sure that there was a variety of materials covered because RDA, as we said in the goals, uh, purported to be able to easily be applied to a variety of materials. The issue of authority data we determined that the test institutions should apply the creation of authority records the same as they would under normal conditions. If they normally created authority records, they should do so for the test. To give you a sense of what we ended up with, and we had no idea that we would have such a large number, we ended up with a total of over 10,000 bibliographic records cataloged according to RDA and over a whopping 12,000 authority records. Now, clearly, this ha will have an impact when it came time to do the analysis of the data. And this is the aspect that worried me as one of the co-leaders the most. How would we analyze all that we collected, even when I thought it was going to be only a fourth of the amount of data that you see represented here? To help us with collecting the data that we were to use in the analysis, we developed survey instruments that would elicit responses from the test participants covering the various aspects of the test itself. We had four sets of questionnaires of surveys that related to the four segments of materials process that I just discussed common original set, common copy set, extra original set, extra copy set. Additionally, we created four surveys that reached out beyond the materials themselves. One, we wanted a response from the institutions that were a part of the test. We wanted the reaction of the management of that institution related to the test and using RDA. We also, because Ferber, on which RDA is based, is so user-driven, we wanted, to the degree that we could, a sense of how the user reacted to the RDA records that he or she encountered. Each record that was created had to have a survey instrument prepared for it. So that gives you a sense of the number of 
surveys that were created associated with those. And then lastly, because we had such a large number of institutions that wanted to participate in the test, and we simply could not manage um, beyond a certain size, we promised that we would have an informal set that anyone who was interested could either weigh in with reactions based on their use of RDA uh, in whatever context that was. So these we called informal testers, but bear in mind that they did not receive the kind of focus training briefing that the formal testers did. This will have a consequence when you see some of the results later on. This gives you a sense of the number of surveys that we received, and you won't be surprised that the number was high when you realize that for every record created, we needed a survey response. And again, it's not a surprise that there were almost 6,000 extra original set, meaning the a record a survey response for the records created using RDA for the normal materials that the institution catalogs. So you can see we had to deal with almost 8,000 survey instruments themselves and all the data that that entailed. And the surveys had not just a single response, but there were comment sections in just about every one, and we want to take into account the comments that the testers were supplied. This leads to this screen, that we, our biggest challenge was how are we going to manage the large amount of data that we had collected as part of the test, and how could we do justice to that with the time frame that we've given ourselves for making a decision and giving a recommendation to our senior management at the three national libraries. The record review process. We certainly wanted to evaluate a percentage of the records in depth so that we could have a good feel for what it was like to catalog using RDA and the reaction of those who were applying the code. That was only possible with the common original set. That is, the set that was cataloged according to RDA and that was cataloged according to the current code. And as we have indicated, by and large, that was ACR2. So for the purposes of the remainder of this presentation, and for our analysis, that's basically a comparison of ACR2 to RDA. As we were doing our analysis, the surrogates that were used for the common original set cataloging were available, and we could refer to them if we needed to based on the responses or the analysis that we were trying to do. I will not go into great detail today in terms of the findings, particularly in terms of specific information that we gleaned from individual institutions, but as fortune would have it, if you will, um, we are bookending the month of August, we being Deanna and I in terms of managers thinking about RDA and the transformation of the bibliographic apparatus, and two members of the coordinating committee at the end of the month will go into greater detail in terms of what were the findings and what did, how did those findings lead to <clears throat> some of the analysis that we had. And I can point out here that because we saved all of the RDA data and records that were created, that this material is there for the world to see, to manipulate, and we hope to be used by researchers in the future in terms of giving us more feedback and information related to transitioning from one code to another. Not that I'm looking forward to coordinating any future tests uh, of this nature.
it was interesting for us on the committee to note that in terms of RDA and ACR2, their consistency in terms of application and the error rate that we found were fairly similar. So that gave us hardness, if you will, in terms of if we were to adopt RDA, that would not necessarily set us back in terms of that aspect of the work. We noted that the errors basically cluster around the required access points related to works and expression. And this will lead to part of the recommendations that we would make to uh, the Joint Steering Committee later on that I'll talk about later on in the presentation. And another area that, that caused us some concern was that the test participants worried that they had maybe had not found all the applicable rules uh, or that they had applied them correctly. So that led to some of the recommendations that we made both to the Joint Steering Committee and to the co-publishers of RDA. It's interesting when you start thinking about the time, how long did it take to process the record. We determined, the committee determined that this was likely the best way to be able to present any kind of valid information regarding the financial cost of implementing this. So we tried to capture how long it took to process the record and to come up with some averages. Um, from this screen, you'll see that that went from a low of one minute to a whopping 720 minutes. Uh, it's here that this was a serial. I'm not sure it was a serial. It may have been a special format item. And you can see with such a great variation, there is a lot of room for interpretation of what this meant. But overall, we can say that once we averaged it out, that the amount of time was about a half an hour per record, which is not terribly um, in excess of what it takes to process an ACR2 record. The other encouraging sign was that as the weeks progressed, uh, after the first 20 records or so that a test participant created, the creation time dropped by 50%. So that indicated that this indeed could be learned and that the learning curve would uh, increase as we proceeded. It's interesting to note that one of the questions we asked related to how does RDA meet your need for the work that you do. Uh, only less than 4% said that it did not meet the need. Um, somewhat 11%, mostly meet 47%, and fully meet 37%. So that gave us uh, encouragement that RDA were to be adopted certainly could serve the purposes and needs of the people involved in the test and therefore extrapolate to a larger community. We also asked the question, which record did we, did one believe was easier to understand? Uh, only 14% thought ACR2 was easier to understand. In fact, 40% uh, thought RDA was easier to understand with another 40% saying was about the same. So again, this was encouraging for us as we got closer and closer to, to making a decision. Some interesting feedback from the user surveys themselves. Um, we tried to compare positive to negative features. A positive feature being the, the content carrier media elements um, that were applied in RDA that supplanted the GMD. Then on the other hand, the negative side was the GMDs were done away with. So this gives you a sense of it depends on one's point of view. A positive aspect were, was that the records were fuller. A negative comment we received, and that doesn't necessarily mean just one, was there was too much information. 
there's been a lot made about the spelling out of previously abbreviated words. A negative aspect of that was, why are we spelling out these words that are universally known? Uh, there was great positive response to the inclusion of the rule, or the dropping of the rule of three, so that the number of creators associated with a, an item could be identified and given credit in terms of searching and uh, finding materials by that particular person. There was confusion about the publication and the copyright date and how that's used. The elimination of Latin terms was considered positive. However, the elimination of six in describing mis incorrectly stated materials in titles were was considered to be a problem. Um, most people applauded the fact that there were more access points. And universally, I think I can say the fervor terminology is an area that caused concern. And obviously, it's an area then that we would have to give focus to going forward, making sure people understand what that terminology means. The costs and benefits of what we uncovered. Clearly, a subscription to RDA is going to be a cost, because unlike the print ACR2 product where you bought the code once and it belonged to you to do whatever you wanted, subscribing to RDA is more like subscribing to a database and other ongoing online content. It's an annual thing, and you don't ever end up owning it. The development of training materials was viewed as being a costly aspect to be considered. Obviously, new documentation had to be created associated with and for that training. And there will be loss of production time as you make the transition, as there's a loss of time in any major transition involving workflow and procedures and processes. And there was concern about the impact on catalog and contract. Will those contractors need to be trained uh, to apply RDA? Is there an extra cost for that? And how would that impact um, operations? Well, there were some benefits as well. A boon to using RDA uh, would be that there's a change in how things are identified. The focus on user tasks is viewed as a very positive aspect. And we talked about that with the find, identify, uh, obtain four elements early on. And it also will lead to an, um, new encoding schemas and better systems for resource discovery. And certainly that's going to be related to the mark aspect that we'll talk about a bit later. I thought it would be interesting to see a couple of pie charts that showed how some of the key findings um, were graphed or were charted using a pie chart. The first question was, do you think that US communities should implement RDA? Um, this is from institutions, the surveys from for each institution that participated in the test. How did the, the institution as an entity view moving forward with RDA? Um, some 24% were ambivalent. A 14% gave a solid no. Um, but 34% said yes. And another 28% said yes with changes. For the record creators themselves, and by these we mean the catalogers who were applying the code as part of the test, uh, we asked the same question. Uh, again, you can see that combined yes of changes and yes unqualified was um, a majority of the responses with some 30% indicating um, outright no. This one related to the informal test is interesting because it gives the largest percentage of 
negative response in terms of moving forward with RDA. And we assume that this is attributable to the fact that informal testers were not trained. They got whatever they knew about RDA on their own or through other training mechanisms, but they did not have the focus attention that the formal testers had as they participate in the test. So you can see that their negative response is much higher. Now we come to the recommendations that we made to the senior management at the three national libraries and the ultimate decision that was adopted that Deanna will talk about it with a bit more detail following me. And that was namely that not sooner than January 2013, the three national libraries should implement uh, RDA if certain conditions are met in the intervening 18 months. We also went further to say that because we were, in essence, imposing this on the information bibliographic cataloging community, we need to take some responsibility to ensure that progress was made and to contribute to that process in any number of ways. And we'll talk about some of that before the presentation ends. In addition to the recommendations that we made to move forward not sooner than January 2013 to our senior management at the three national libraries, we also had recommendations to various communities that play a key role in either development of RDA, in maintenance of RDA, in sustaining RDA, or in making sure that RDA is implemented and applied in a way that is economically feasible. They are namely the U.S. library community in general, including the program for cooperative cataloging, the Joint Steering Committee, the vendor community, and to the RDA co-publishers led by ALA Publishing. To the Joint Steering Committee, we had a list of recommendations, and I chose to highlight several that I thought were key and would be key to the work that would need to take place in the next 18 months. In addition to indicating a recommendation, the committee, the coordinating committee, attempted, based on what we knew, uh, based on our work and the communities to which we were addressing these recommendations, we also tried to attach a timeline expectation so that we could track the work that was being done. So the first one relates to we had indicated in the report, rewrite RDA in clear and plain English. We really didn't mean rewrite in the sense of changing the substance or the content of RDA. We really could have used a different word. And in fact, during ALA presentations and discussions, we have started using the word reword instead of rewriting. This has implications because we don't want to upset the thrust and direction of RDA, and there are implications for translations that are being done even as we speak related to RDA being translated into German and, and any number of other languages, German and French are the two that come to mind initially. Another recommendation to JSD that I felt worth talking about this afternoon is the process for how RDA gets updated in an uh, online web environment. Unlike HR2, where there had to be a mechanism of submitting proposals, those proposals sitting being disseminated, with a online in an online environment, there's no reason that uh, there can't be regular updates in a seamless way. Obviously, as these updates are done, there needs to be a mechanism for letting the community know um, what the changes have been, and we need to develop how frequently those updates need to occur. This one was to Joint Steering Committee, but it also applied to the co-publishers because whatever changes are made, there needs to be an indication in the web, the RDA toolkit itself, as to what was happening. So next uh, community that we talked about was ALA Publishing and the co-publishers. And a lot that we got out of the test was that the RDA toolkit itself was difficult to use. I do note, um, as I noted in the 
previous screen that I didn't actually address, that a lot of the changes that we talked about either were underway or had already been thought about. And so all we're doing basically is reaffirming that these things came out as part of the test. So one of the first recommendations to the ALA um, publishing and the co-publishers is to enhance the functionality of the toolkit. And uh, Troy Linker, who's been leading that effort at ALA Publishing, uh, has already indicated many of these changes are in place. And we'll be talking about these as he talks to the community in webinars that he and ALA host. There will was a lot of requests for more examples, more RDA examples. So we give this recommendation to ALA Publishing, but we, the Library of Congress, also assume that we will work to find examples that we can supply. And we also made this recommendation to the Joint Steering Committee as well. So this really turns out to be one of those collaborative recommendations that we all will work on. To the Library of Congress, um, we recognize that we'll take a big lead in many of these tasks, and we um, are happy to be able to do this if it helps us to make this transformation and to lead to this more robust bibliographic environment that Deanna and I were talking about as part of this uh, presentation this afternoon. <clears throat> One of the big pieces is to begin a transition from Mark to uh, another kind of carrier. Uh, Deanna will talk a bit more about that from a policy and a leadership level. And I will give a bit more in terms of a practical aspect before I end. The library also will take the lead in involving the community in the process. And this one really is encompassing because in anything that we do, as Deanna said in the lead in, we want to be transparent, and part of that transparency is engaging the various communities that can help us move this forward so that it is not a Library of Congress initiative so much as the Library of Congress has taken the leadership role to assure that it happens. And the final aspect on this one has to do with training. And we are taking um, an active stance in helping with the training, both in terms of documentation uh, as well as the actual training itself. Now, the next steps related to the RDA Test Coordinating Committee focus on <clears throat> what will be our ongoing role. We have developed and we have coordinated and overseen the test, done analysis, and made recommendations. Now comes the monitoring aspect over the next 18 months to be assured that by January 2013, we can send a positive, unequivocal statement to the community that we would be aiming for a January 2013 implementation. We also, as part of that, want to develop and have already begun working on a communications plan and how we will alert the community to our plan and to keep an ongoing status update of all that is happening. The next step for LC, in addition to what I talked about previously, would be we will definitely keep updated the RDA transition, uh, frequently asked questions, document that we issued prior to ALA annual and that it's mounted on our website. We also are creating a new web page that will become the web page to go to to find out everything related to interim steps that we'll be taking between now and January 2013, whether it's training or any other aspect related to RDA implementation or planning for the implementation. And we have a very a strong role that we want to play in coordinating all that we're doing with the program for cooperative cataloging. You'd be interested, no doubt, to know what kind of timeline we have in terms of if we stick to the expected January 2013 implementation date. 
on the web page that I just referred to in the previous screen, we will mount information related to the timeline that we have set for ourselves. The first one that you may be interested in is October 2011. This is when we will start retraining or giving reorientations and briefings to the RDA testers here at LC because I want them to begin applying RDA starting in November 2011. This is not a pre-implementation so much as it is a means of our having hands-on feedback as we revamp the training documentation and prepare for the training that can be used both by, by the Library of Congress and by PCC. So after the October training come November, those our former RDA testers, whom we will now call RDA catalogers, both catalogers and technicians, uh, will begin applying RDA, both in terms of creating bibliographic and authority data. For the rest of LC staff, then, not sooner than July 2012, will we think about training the larger LC cataloging community. Because one, we want to make sure that we are on track to have an implementation in 2013. And by the time we start training staff new to RDA, we want them to be able to begin applying that so they don't lose what they learn. So we're hoping that the timeline that we set up for ourselves will help the community in planning for the implementation. If any of this changes because there are aspects that are not on track, then we can also update that and share that with the community. From a practical standpoint, and Deanna will talk about it from her level, for the transition from Mark to um, a new carrier, one of the things that we determined prior to ALA Annual and that we've begun with our internal uh, group that Deanna is leading and that is doing the background work to make sure this stays on track, is that we have determined that by September 2011, we want to have a draft of an outline of a plan of what this might entail. We want to have a draft of the list of experts, stakeholders, uh, interested parties who would be uh, helping us move this major, major shift forward. And this would need to be national and international beyond the library community, the semantic web community, any community that, and the linked data community, any community that is interested in sharing uh, information and bibliographic data. And we wanted to come up with a draft timeline of, if not beyond one year, at least what we thought could be accomplished within the next fiscal year. <clears throat> For us, that means October 1, 2011 through September 30, 2012. With that, I have given you a high level view of what the test entailed, how we got to our decision, and hopefully how this will be one component of building a robust bibliographic infrastructure for the future, with RDA being one of those components. So with that, I'll turn it back to boss Deanna Markham, and she will end the presentation with her views and comments, and then it will be open for questions from the community, the listeners. Thank you, Beecher. <clears throat> I just wanted to let all of you know that um, when I received the report from the RDA test group, I sent it to the um, external working group on the future of bibliographic control, and I asked them for their comments. And I had a, a teleconference with them to discuss the report. And a couple of people said, well, this, this isn't a ringing endorsement of RDA. How could you proceed? And the more we talked, it became clear that we needed to proceed because, A, um, this is better than what we have now. B, it's the only international um, activity that's underway for, uh, to help us think through bibliographic uh, description and cataloging. 
And when I talk to my colleagues at the National Agricultural Library and the National Library of Medicine, they agreed that it is terribly important that we try this, even if it's imperfect, that we make every effort to link library resources to the wider world of information resources, and that we modify this as we need to. And so I think we all enter this new era with a lot of enthusiasm, with lots of questions, uh, with certainty that we don't have it perfectly right yet, but that with the help of everyone who's involved in working on this, Gosh. that we will do better. So with that, we will turn it over now to your questions, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Deanna, thank you very much. This is Pamela. I'm going to uh, read some of the questions, and I'm also going to try and get my slides back on the screen just so that we have something to look at. Somehow they, they went away. Uh, but just give me one second here to, to bring this back up. Um, the first question um, concerns the comments that Beecher made about the time, the times that were factored in in creating the records. Uh, if authority records were created, are those factored into the times? Yes. I, can you hear me? Yes, but you, please speak up because we've had some questions about not being able to hear clearly. So the, the, if you could speak as loudly as possible, that would be helpful. Yeah, I will do that. Yes, <laughs> authorities were factored in. Authority creation time. All right. Second question is um, uh, uh, regarding your slide number 18. I don't know if you, you will remember what that was. Do they have data on the median time required to create a record? Yes, we have quite a bit of data related to this, and <clears throat> to the degree that there's an interest, Regina Reynolds and Barbara Bushman are listening to today's session, and part of what they will do is tweak the, their presentation to try to incorporate areas of interest. So hopefully they can add a bit more to their talk on the 31st. All right, next question. When users were surveyed, how were the records shown to the users? On paper, in the context of an ILS, what display? They were shown to the user in the context of their local system. However, they would have encountered those records. And we left it also beyond that. We left it up to the testers at those institutions to determine if they wanted to have a session with users looking at the system or bring in public services staff and users and sit down with them. So there could have been a variety of ways, but we just simply wanted them to use their ingenuity and the environment of their local institution to determine the best way to elicit information feedback from the users. So it could have varied from institution to institution, but it definitely was focused on the local environment. Thanks. Okay, next question. For those of us in small, single cataloger environments not using the online toolkit, will there be recommendations for updates to the print RDA manual? I expect that there will. Uh, this is a question that ALA Publishing clearly will be focusing on what and how to manage the print product along with the web tool. So some of this feedback will definitely go to for Linker and ALA Publishing, who happened to be in town, meeting in Washington, D.C. this week for a meeting. So I will be meeting with him starting on Wednesday of this week through Friday. Okay, next question. Will LC RDA cataloging be applied to CIP? Yes, it will. In fact, it was applied to CIP during the test, and we've been receiving since then the published books associated with that cataloging and the SIP upgrades of those records have been done according to RDA by the former RDA testers so that we continue to have an RDA record for 
something that started out as an RDA record. All right. Budgeting for 2012. In your opinion, do you think we need to allocate funds to purchase the RDA toolkit or supporting documentation? For the second part of that question, it depends on what you mean by supporting documentation. Clearly anything that the Library of Congress is creating related to uh, RDA cataloging will be available to charge. Anything <coughs> directly associated with RDA Toolkit is a part of that. Uh, what One of the things I was trying to do by including a timeline for our bringing on Library of Congress staff who have not been involved in RDA is to begin thinking about the timing. Is this a difficult question to answer? One, because it depends on how an institution plans for its budget for the year and what that year encompasses. If indeed we're on track to implement RDA by January 2013, we will have a strong sense of that, I'm thinking, by mid calendar year 2012, that is by June, July 2012. So we want to keep the community updated in terms of how things are going and how we're planning for that so that that can help with the um, they're allocating their budget to be able to buy RDA. Certainly ALA Publishing has extended its two for one and it has uh, a number of options for those in training and how they can have access to the toolkit. So I urge those interested in making a transition in the coming fiscal or calendar year to go to the uh, RDA toolkit site and see what options are there and make contact accordingly and follow the timeline that we will be updating on our website here at LC and follow the update that the coordinating committee will be sharing with the community in terms of how the whole process is moving forward with the conditional action items. Okay, um, next question. The websites mentioned by Beecher at the very end, have they been created or are they still in progress? We have submitted those to our internal um, certification and accreditation. I think those are the two terms I want to use right. uh, so that we can mount those sites. Since they've gone there, we expect in the next week or so that they will be approved and they will be live. And as soon as they are, we will be notifying the community uh, via the normal listservs and other posting so that the community knows that these sites are live and this is where you track what's going on. Okay, this is Cindy. I'm going to take over. Um, Beecher, the next question really is more a comment. You may w wish to react to it or not. Many responses to RDA mark being substandard really come down to the poor quality of the local systems in the market. Let's face up to specifying what local systems catalogs must be able to do before we spend so much time reworking rules for cataloging, encoding methods, and systems. That's a fair statement. And I would say it's being addressed a number of ways. It certainly will come into play as the Library of Congress leads the effort to make a transition from Mark to another carrier. We, the coordinating committee, almost from the very beginning, made it a point to hold regular meetings with representatives from the vendor community, starting with the ALA midwinter meeting in Denver. And for every subsequent meeting, in addition to meeting with a test participant, we also met separately with the vendor community. And we continue to do that through the ALA annual meeting in New Orleans. So we wanted them aware of what this is about. We think that with a firmer indication that RDA will be adopted if other aspects are taken care of that the vendor community will seriously be engaged in what it will take to make a shift. And you're right, 
you don't get the full advantage of RDA and the fervorization of data unless system and system vendors make changes to their software and systems. So we assume that some of that will be happening as a part of that process. It will be happening as part of our leading the effort for transition for MARC and by virtue of ongoing conversations in general. Also, thirdly, ALA Publishing has been reaching out and is working also directly with the vendor community. So those three approaches we are hoping will help in terms of having the vendor community engaged and participating in this transition. Okay, good, thanks. Um, the next question you actually you led into very nicely. Is there any more information regarding the plan to transition? I, it says to Mark, but I think it must be away from um, Mark to other things. <laughs> um, as I indicated in one of my slides, the next step for us is to come up with a draft outline of a plan, and we are on our way for that. We met last week, and um, I'm certainly comforted by what came out of that meeting. We're also looking at developing a list of stakeholders, experts from various communities, including the library community. The Library Network Development and Mark Sanders Office has already created a website that will be focused on this process and like for the RDA test, it will be a site where any and everyone can go to to get the latest information on how this is um, transpiring. And then secondly, that same office has developed a listserv that will be used to communicate among um, participants in the process. And then lastly, this internal LC group will come up with a timeline of what we happen over the next 12 to 18 months. We have promised Deanna that we'll have that for her by mid-September for her to react to, so that by the end of September or early October, she can issue that as the next step and decide how she wants us to proceed with this larger venue. And she can plan for how she wants to further involve the community in the next fiscal and calendar year. And I should say, too, that uh, we've had a few conversations already with some of uh, the technical experts thinking about what the next generation carrier should uh, consist of. And as we uh, continue to have meetings like that with different groups of stakeholders and experts, we will be posting all of that information on our website. So everyone will be able to follow it. Okay, good. Um, the next question is um, st quite straightforward. Does your testing, did your testing have a control group? We had a control group of materials and that was a common original set, the 25 titles that we had everybody cataloged so that and what I didn't go into in any detail is we had that set of 25 titles that all the test participants cataloged. We, the three national libraries, LC, NAL, and NLM, actually sat down and cataloged those, and we used those as benchmarks among ourselves. It was interesting to see that we were not always on the same page in terms of our interpretation of that catalog, and not just for the RDA side of it, but for the ACR2 side as well. So all that underscored to us was that there is a leeway of judgment that can be applied to the processing, which is one of the things that I stress and, and stressing more and more to the catalogs at LC, that I want them to exercise judgment, and that as long as that judgment is within a framework that the records will be interoperable and the recipients of those records can have some confidence that they will fit into their existing databases. Okay. Um, the next question is, will the ILS need to be upgraded to reflect RDA records and retrieval in general? And I'm not sure whether this is what you've already spoken about with the vendors or whether it's actually an individual library's I ILS will need to be tweaked to accommodate RDA. 
But one of the things that we, we had to make a set of assumptions when we started the test, and one of those assumptions was that the test would be conducted in the current environment, that is, using the systems that currently exist. The only thing that had to be changed in order to move forward were certain mark fields, and those were done by Marby, and those were in place by the time the test was initiated. And they will, they're in place now, and they will be used until systems are totally revamped uh, to be able to uh, pulverize, if you will, data that's loaded in them. So technically, systems don't need to do any more than be able to accommodate the mark changes that were initiated for RDA itself. And once they do that, then these records clearly um, can intermingle in the existing databases. What you don't have is the full functionality of what verbalization will do in terms of relating the records, of relating the data elements uh, in a way that a fully revamped system and a robust carrier will allow RDA and Ferber to do for the community. Again, that's looking towards that robust future. Okay. The next question is a pretty interesting one. Should current library school students be trained in both AACR2 and RDA? In anticipation of the move from Mark, what should current library school students and practicing catalogers learn, e.g., XML? Um, I was asked that question several times at the ALA conference, and the answer I gave, Beecher may have another one, but I suggested that it's important for students to understand both because um, they don't know where they'll be finding jobs, and it's important that they understand the uh, system that's now in place, and they need to know what's coming. So I think it's important for library schools to find ways to incorporate both into the curriculum. I agree. OK, good. OK, has an editor been identified for the rewording of RDA? No. The Committee of Principals is meeting in Washington this week starting on Thursday. That is one of the agenda items for that group. We have been in contact with the chair of the Joint Steering Committee who has given us, given us being the coordinating, test coordinating committee, a set of questions so that JSC can begin that process. So all of that is being worked on now. So there is, a, there is active engagement in moving forward on that. OK. Um, when can we expect to see activity on the new bib frame list serve? Well, I think that should be um, as soon as we get ourselves organized for the next step. I think we'll be posting a, a number of documents there. OK. So shortly. Shortly. Good. Is there somewhere we can see comparison views of RDA and MARC records? We have talked about that. I don't think we have it currently mounted. Um, but that is something we wanted to do. And we talked about it also in association with identifying or creating examples of RDA? So the answer, my immediate answer is no. OK. Um, what existing communication formats are you researching? Well, we already talked about that. Um, unless you have anything else to say on it. Nope, OK. There is a fact regarding the plans to update RDA in print at, this is from Troy Linker, and he's given um, a URL, http www.rdatoolkit.org, FAC, number sign, print update. So, OK. If a small library didn't use MARC, can it start directly with RDA? Um. To the same degree that it could apply ACR2, I depends on what system 
I assume there's a system as opposed to a manual. So I'm not, I don't have quite enough information in that question to answer that with any confidence. Okay. Um, I'm just reading these without, some of these without having read them, so apologies. Are all RDA records to be excluded from OCLC until at least January 2013? Will you comment on changes that will be done to the RDA records that were in OCLC during the test period, e.g. the 7XX fields and authority records, etc.? All of those are steps to be worked out. OCLC indicated during ALA annual meetings that it will be issuing what it's calling, I believe, a white paper sometime this fall, so I would expect in the next month or two, that describes its plan for RDA and WorldCat. Certainly RDA will, I mean, OCLC will continue to accept RDA records because it, it never stops accepting those records. It has memberships from around the world. And as many as eight of the original test participants in the RDA test continue to apply RDA. So those records have been submitted to OCLC. When LC resumes creating records according to RDA in November, those records will be distributed um, on a regular basis to OCLC and to the world as we do any records, just as we did during the test. So there will always, and that's one of the things that we underscore. We're already in a mixed environment, and we will remain in a mixed environment. The question is, how fast will that tip from all the legacy data that are there in any number of, uh, according to any number of sets of instructions versus RDA um, attaining primacy in terms of the amount of data? Okay. Um, question for the speakers. How can catalogers suggest changes to existing RDA rules while they're being rewritten, or are no rules going to be changed? I think that will come out as part of what, RD, uh, what the Joint Steering Committee tells us in terms of what is the mechanism for updating RDA. And, that, and you may recall that was one of the points I had at the recommendation of JSC. So, JSC has already thought about this and may, there may be an imminent announcement of how that is to work. But that's a JSC process and we simply ask that it be made public and they are really working on that. Okay. Cindy, this is Pamela. I'll ask that question okay. now. Um, Beecher, we have a question here that uh, reads as follows. Sounds like RDF is the way you all are talking about with the openness, linked, collaborative, etc. Is that what you meant? And so we wondered if that had to do with RDF instead of RDA. Well, as Deanna said, we have already started talking to experts and there are some experts that we've talked to are from the RDF community that clearly is going to be one of the areas that we look at. Um, we don't have a preferred path at this point. In fact, it might end up being modular or any number of approaches uh, as we move forward. I don't know if Deanna wants to say any more on that or not. When we had a group of technical experts here, oh, there was at least one person who was arguing for RDF. but. The others in the group argued for modifications, enhancements, other approaches. So I think there's a lot of discussion yet to be done. Okay. Um, I think this one is a repeat, and if it is, just say so. Can Deanna expand on the process she envisions for looking for a replacement for Mark? Um, I can just reiterate, uh, we will be putting together, Beecher, and an internal group at the Library of Congress is working on a timeline and the scope of the project. They will give that to me by mid-September. So I'm hoping that by October, early October, we'll be able to announce the full schedule of what we're doing, who will be involved, what we will be doing, how people can uh, stay up to date about what we're doing. 
Okay. Well, skipping ahead, I see one that asks, is there anything we should start doing to prepare for the transition from Mark? Sounds like it's premature. Well, I think um, it, it's not premature for anyone with good ideas to let us know what they are. Okay, good. Um, does it make sense to do training RDA in MARC format while MARC may be replaced by something else? That sort of is a valid question and it's come to us and we have to say we can't stand still while we look to the future and, and make a transition. So just as we decided we had to launch the RDA test in the current environment, I think we have to proceed to carry on day-to-day -day activities, whether that's training in the environment that we have, and when we have something different, we would throw that into the mix. But right now, I think it is the current environment in which we find right. that. And I see this very uh, much as a transition period. Um, someone commented to me, and I have I'm not vouching at all for the authenticity of this, but someone said, we've calculated there are 9 billion MARC records all over the world. So we have a huge legacy issue to deal with, and it's going to take some time to find the appropriate new carrier and to help libraries of all sizes and types make the transition. So I think we need to look at this as a kind of evolutionary process. Um, I don't envision a day when we'll turn off the switch on Mark and, and start something new. I think we'll be seeing things phased in over time. OK. The next question is, I think, still in the same vein. Have the participants, fellow CNAL and NLM, investigated other metadata object descriptive environments and their paradigm shifts? KIMU, TMS, for example. But only if you, the metadata community, defines its object, e.g. person, place, thing, material, provenance, etc. It's a whopper. <laughs> I can't say that we have explored anything specifically, but I think it gets back to Deanna's point that everything is open for discussion in the coming weeks, months, and to see what the best options are, what combination of options work. Okay. Will the MARC transition lists be public? Yes. Okay. Will there be organized training classes held to instruct RDA, and who will coordinate this training? When can we expect it to begin? We at the library, um, in our policy and standards division, um, led by Barbara Tillett and Judy Hagen in particular, are working even as we speak this afternoon on the training materials, we will certainly be doing some of that training here at LC. What we've typically done over the past year or so is we've recorded some of the training sessions that we do for staff here, and that then becomes available for those in the community to use. We share freely the syllabus and um, course materials that we create both with other national Anglo libraries and with our colleagues of the to uh, the U.S. National Library. So it's through that mechanism, and we get requests for policy specialists to go out and train in the community. We'll have one of those sessions in Georgia this next week for the public library community, which we are excited about because we are particularly happy to see that segment of library community ready to uh, hear and learn more about that. So all these things, as we do them, we either use those same materials or we are tweaking those materials so that they can be used more broadly and shared um, frequently and have the webinars that we create so that people can pull down at, at their leisure. Okay. Is there a plan B if the recommendations are not sufficiently met? We have agreement from the National Agricultural Library and the National Library of Medicine to work with us very closely to monitor 
the recommendations. And we will develop a plan B as if that becomes necessary. But we will be meeting regularly to um, we'll have timelines associated with all of these things. And we'll see if um, the work is progressing as we expect. I think this following one's been asked a couple in a couple of different ways, but I'll see if you have anything new to add. I would imagine RDA will have to be taught in academia for those earning an MLS. Will LC take a role in preparing new cataloggers for the future? Deanna, you want to stab at that one? Well, I, I think um, everything Beecher's talked about in terms of our putting uh, all of the information that we're using internally on the web. Um, we're speaking to as many groups as possible. So we are certainly trying to do our part in that way. In addition, uh, we invite library school students to come to the Library of Congress for short or even longer internships. We've had uh, several library schools use their spring breaks to come to the Library of Congress. So and slowly people are getting um, hands-on experience with what we're doing here. Uh, we can't be everywhere, but we try to make all of our content available to people so that it is readily used. OK. Will any other surveys be conducted to see if the four user tasks are really being met better by RDA than existing AEC or two? We don't intend to do any more surveys in the immediate future. The one area where we will have to have some sort of mini test, if you will, is in regard to any reworded chapters of RDA, because we'll need to see if the rewording is indeed uh, more straightforward. And we've begun discussing with JSC how we want to do that measurement and under what circumstances. So that's the closest thing to any kind of a, an additional survey that we have any plan for at the moment. OK. Will OCLC be involved in this process? OCLC will be involved as it has been almost from the beginning of the test, because it is a major player in this. And so much of our data ends up on or in OCLC's rural cat. So one of the things that we'll be waiting for, of course, will be to see what the OCLC white paper on RDA next steps is and how that dovetails with what we're doing. But all along, we've had a representative from OCLC either attend our meetings or call in to our meetings, particularly we get to some point where we know if we make a decision either as a joint um, coordinating the committee or as LC as a um, lead entity that we need to make sure it's in sync. And because OCLC is part of the program for cooperative cataloging, there's all, there's, there are all of those um, intermingling pieces, if you will. OK. We've got about eight questions left in about two minutes. <laughs> so I'm trying to scan them to see if there's um, any really different ones, interesting ones here. Is the museum community a part of this committee in, in terms of replacing Mark? Um, we have had conversations with a number of people uh, who, who say that uh, they definitely should be involved. So we, many of the technical people we've talked to thus far have experience with both the library community, the museum community, and the archival community. And I think it's increasingly evident to all of us that we have to include all of them to the extent possible. Good. OK. Pamela, would you say that's it, or should I keep going? Um, I think we should end, but let me just say that whatever questions we ha uh, Deanna and Beecher have not answered this afternoon will be answered uh, as best as the, uh, we can um, afterwards, and the replies will be sent out because we do keep a log of all the questions. And there's only about eight of them. So, so we did very well. Yes. And Deanna and Beecher, 
Thank you so much. We really appreciated you sharing your thoughts and your knowledge and wisdom with us. Thank you and for giving us time to do it. We appreciate it. Well, we're really glad you were willing to do it. Um, I'd also like to thank Felicity and um, Jackie, who were our technical support today. They've had a very busy time. Um, there was some fading in and out with sound quality, and we apologize for that. But when you've got almost 700 people on the line, that happens. I do want to point out that the fall season of Alex webinars starts on August 24th with a session on the art of scanning, which will be presented by Paul Royster of the University of Nebraska. The August 31st webinar, which we have alluded to already, is, will be by Barbara Bushman from NLM and Regina Romano Reynolds from Library of Congress. It's the first in a series of five webinars on various aspects of RDA, and in some sense we'll pick up where Deanna and Beecher left off today. Complete details about all the continuing education offerings can be found on the Alex website. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we hope you will participate with other, in other Alex activities again in the near future.